Okay, hints, foreshadowing, all that fun stuff that WoW is full of, and has been going back to its oldest days. So today, we are going to dive into all that cheeky hinting that Blizzard has been doing over the years. There's some really neat stuff today, so I hope you're gonna have a whole bunch of fun in this video brought to you by you, because we launched weekly podcasts over on Patreon. So if you'd like hours more content, including our Yog saron deep dive, the Patreon is the place to go. Plus also loot. This month, we've got a regal mace, amongst other things. So cheers, and let's go. To begin, let's travel back in time, because for ages, World of Warcraft was dependent on the lore from the RTS games, right? We got all our heroes and all our villains and really any lore, all from what was established back in, well, the 90s up to 2002. And that was pretty much true until Cataclysm. Ghostcrawler even explained that it was only after Wrath that Blizzard began to plot a couple of expansions ahead. And you'll kind of see how a lot of that worked as you go through today's video. So this older era was a different time. Blizzard planned less, Intentional hints are harder to find, but goddamn, there is some fascinating foreshadowing. Elling Terris is just a great example. He is World of Warcraft's most well-connected cheesemaker. Because in addition to being the cheesemonger of Stormwind, he's also an SI7 spy. Elling was a contact, right, in the missing diplomat quest chain. That was the quest chain that involved tracking down the, at the time, missing king of Stormwind, Varian Rin, which of course was kind of foreshadowing Wrath of the Lich King's events where Varian returned. Later though, in a quest called Look to an Old Friend, Elling jokes about Deathwing being alive and attacking Stormwind. When did that happen? Later, he then sends us to meet a gnome contact of his called Tyrion, who sarcastically comments that he's in fact waiting for the dark portal to open. So that's, uh, just by the way, three expansions foreshadowed in one classic quest line. Uh, for another thing, how about that one crazy travel quest from the Gelkis in Desolus to the Swamp of Sorrows? Super fun at 60% move speed, but quite notable because you get to see a broken Draenei. Of course, at that time in Classic, people thought that the Draenei and the Broken were one and the same. Check out our video in TBC lore to learn how that lore was shattered. Perhaps my favorite example, though, is actually the evolution of the Forsaken, because this tracks forward. If you look hard enough in vanilla, you can actually tell that a big, big betrayal was in the Horde's future. In the quest, nothing but the truth, an Alliance spy told us that the Forsaken were actually misleading the Horde. But it gets much stranger because in Alteric, Warden Bellamur dropped his research journal. Now, if you've not read his journal, you've got to check it out. It's wild. Now, this is very early WoW lore, but it really gives an impression of the direction Blizzard wanted to go with the Forsaken. So, Bellamur is a Kirintor mage who was approached by a Forsaken named Keegan, seeking sanctuary. He tells them that, quote, remnants of the old gods still linger in the deep hollows of this world. The new forces seek to harness that ancient power. And he then gives the Kirin Tor a bloodstone pendant, which is implied to be made from the blood of an old god. Now, the undertone of this story, of course, is that Sylvanas is experimenting with the blood of old gods, and that Keegan, uh, of course, had brought that pendant to the Kirin Tor so that it couldn't be used. Because old god stuff is bad. And now there was a lot of speculation during BFA that Sylvanas was working for Nazoth, which of course she was not, but she was working alongside Nazoth's plans. Nazoth really, in a way, worked into her plan. I guess both of those characters would say that, wouldn't they? But of course, the connection, the idea of Sylvanas actually using Black Empire related artifacts and stuff. Yeah, we saw it in Battle for Azeroth, but it was teased in vanilla. So I hope you enjoy that blast from the past. Now it is time to talk about more recent affairs. The Great Teasing of the Shadowlands. Well, we're going to start it off with 
There being two types of hints that we kind of missed going into Shadowlands. There is broad foundational stuff that helped the expansion to actually make sense, and then of course there are direct references to events that we would experience. Now we could go back to Icecrown Citadel or Edge of Night for the fundamentals, but okay, let's be real here. Shadowlands was obviously not planned at that point. Personally, I think we need to jump forward to Warlords of Draenor for our first conscious hints of the Shadowlands. Death Speaking. Death Speaking was a new aspect of the alternate universe Shadow Moon clan of orcs. Ner'zhul, as the head of this quite death obsessed clan, was a powerful necromancer, and when confronted under the Dark Star, he threatened to sacrifice all of his ancestors to save his clan. You know, kind of sucking up their anima. But the thing is, this is all made far more literal whenever we finally face him down in the Shadow Moon burial grounds in a bit called the Edge of Reality, when he invites us to cross into the realm of the Shadowlands. I mean, it's not like we stood atop Ice Crown Citadel, looked at the Edge of Reality, and then crossed into the Shadowlands a few months ago. We actually did it in Shadow Moon burial grounds, in Wad. Now, oddly enough here, the shadow and lands of Shadowlands were separate words when Ner'zhul said them, but you get the point. Shadowlands. Speaking of necromancers, the Mogu. So here's the thing. Do you remember the anima fight in Throne of Thunder, right? The anima golems. Well, that anima is described as, quote, life energy harnessed and condensed into liquid form. You know, it goes by the same name as Anima, that thing we're collecting in the Shadowlands. You might be thinking, what's the connection, Michael? Well, I'm going to tell you, it's Glory of the Nathria Raider. Because in the Glory of the Nathria Raider achievement kind of mini hard mode of the Dark Vein encounter, you literally spawn a Mogu Anima Golem. There is a Mogu Anima Golem that looks the same as the one in Throne of Thunder in Castle Nathria. Ah, that's pretty big. Lei Shen was clearly up to a whole bunch of stuff. I mean, he consumed the essence of a titan. He engaged in fleshcraft using anima. I mean, fleshcraft is how he created all of this stuff using anima. Come on. I mean, you've, you've got to wonder if the jailer's agents ever hit him up, right? I suppose we'll never know. Back to Order to Draenor, then. There actually may be a very early hint, because in Spires of Iraq, of course, Admiral Taylor, beloved character, uh, got into trouble with a necromancer called Epithal, who killed and raised a whole alliance garrison. Now, Epithal claims that the Dark One promised him something if he succeeded. And there's been a lot of... A lot of speculation about that, but you do have to wonder if that Dark One could be some form of villain from the Shadowlands. Kel'Thuzad, Muzala, the Jailer. I absolutely wouldn't be surprised, because there's actually quite a lot of hints around death going on, especially with the Shadow Moon Clan, in that expansion. And the hints actually continued with the selfie patch, 6.1, because in that, there are Death and Lich King hints. Because Darien appears, this is before Bolvar actually woke up, remember, Darien appears basically trying to learn how to save Bolvar by looking at A.U. Ner'zhul. And we all know where that went. So that's less of a tease, but it's very much the very earliest setup of a massive new plot arc. But where things really got heated up is, of course, Legion and BFA. So let's dive in. Legion was filled with Shadowlands references. Really, uh, some were Blizzard moving their characters into place, like with, say, Bolvar waking up. But there were less obvious things, like Helia's scheming from the shadows to keep Odin locked up in the Halls of Valor and her use of the Soul Cage. All parts of Legion expansion lore that would go on to be key in Shadowlands especially that lore found in the Legend of Odin, which gives us, uh, well, a pretty damn good hint at how Blizzard planned early Shadowlands stuff, because of course the likes of Odin were big introductions of the Legion expansion. 
big introductions that directly set up Shadowlands, because part of the legend of Odin is the story of him, as we know, sacrificing his eye to who we would later find out is Muzala. Now, there was a lot of speculation. We saw that Muzala was actually featured in the Warcraft Traveler children's book, where he wanted to consume, uh, well, he wanted death to consume Azeroth. And then in Battle for Azeroth, we actually found a shrine to him in Zandalar, and if you go all the way back to Zulfarak, you'll see that he's actually been in the game since the beginning. But the most subtle hint to the Shadowlands was in Legion's final secret, a dark place. This was awesome. The secret finding community teased this one out over several months, and it eventually brought them literally to the Shadowlands. Yeah. The puzzle rewards a toy, which lets you summon in the Draenei child Una, uh, who of course you save from Soul Eaters in an area called the Dark Place. And that's an area now confirmed to be inside the Shadowlands. And that means that if you get that area and also Helheim, oh, you've got two times in the Legion expansion where we literally were already in the Shadowlands. All right, getting more into Battle for Azeroth, we've got the clear Bolvar, Bomsamdi, and Sylvanas set up. So let's dive a little bit deeper. Take a look at other things. So first up, the Tauren Heritage Armor. In its acquisition, players crossed into the Spirit Realm to find these five different spirit guides. Now each guide was in the form of an animal. And if you actually look at their animal forms, they're not that far away from night face soul shapes. So I have to wonder, now, the Shadowlands connection here was made super clear when the evil ghost attacks you. Because look at the model of that ghost. It is, in fact, the same as the player spirit model in Shadowlands. <laughs> These spirit models uh, then made a more well-known appearance during Vol Jin and Bomsamdi's storyline. And then, of course, you've got all that stuff about Bomsamdi and his boss. I mean, that's pretty massive, I think, so massive that really we don't see the point in diving into it in this video. Now, there were broader hints going on, like the willingness of the Forsaken to serve Sylvanas, saying that they had seen the same darkness that she had warned them of. And that's perhaps the very same darkness that Arthas mentioned as he died atop Ice Crown. So you can see all these little pieces coming together. Finally, there was a pivotal storyline building in front of our eyes throughout Battle for Azeroth. And that was actually the parallels with Arthas. It began in the battle for Lordaeron as Anduin marched through the city's gates in a one for one, like replication of Arthas walking into Lordaeron, right down to say this shot matching Arthas's face on the box art for Warcraft 3. At the time, loads of people thought this was just a neat little aesthetic parallel, perhaps not realizing, uh, well, how literal they would make some of those parallels. Oh, and also there is some obvious stuff like with the Drust, right? You know, that all of course played into Shadowlands with the likes of Thros and Helheim, not the Maw being the you know first times we'd actually go into the Shadowlands. Okay, let's move on to the next expansion. The hints leading into Battle for Azeroth fall into two categories. First, there's Azeroth as a world soul, and you've got the faction War. Now, the idea of Azeroth being a world soul, that's been percolating since Magni was turned into a diamond in Cataclysm. There's a lot of speculation there. But what I'd rather do is look at some of the lesser known signs that loads of people could have missed. So, from Cataclysm onwards, Blizzard started to refer to Azeroth as a she. So that kind of hints that there was a little bit more than meets the eye. And then, of course, as Warcraft Chronicle came, that's when we really, really did find out that Azeroth is actually a world soul and where Blizzard built out all that Titan lore. Now, back in patch 5.2, we helped Rathian consume the heart of Le Shen. And that caused an ancient voice to speak through him, with that voice saying, We have fallen. We must rebuild the final Titan. So that had us thinking, Azeroth's the final Titan. How do we rebuild her? What's going on? So, of course, that's helping to build up the pivotal Titan lore, and that voice was, of course, Amon Thul, because Le Shen had absorbed his power and Rathian had eaten his heart. Ilden and Magni, of course, later referred to Azeroth as the final Titan in Antorus, making that an extremely clear connection. 
The imminent threat of Nazoth to the world soul was then subtly hinted in the run-up to Battle for Azeroth. It was kind of confusing to some people. Some actually thought that BFA was going to be just a pure faction war expansion. Obviously, that didn't happen. Um, that's that thing. There's always been cryptic warnings about an old god attack. Now, during the Emerald Nightmare raid of the Legion expansion, Malfurion made it very clear that he thought an attack was imminent, telling us that the Black Armies would rise up from the depths. And was very much made clear that while we were dealing with the Legion, well, the old gods were planning their moves. Now, in 7.3.5, in Silithus, we saw that big wound left by Sargaris. Now, around that, the Twilight's Hammer had basically set up shop. A bit strange. Not that surprising, but one of their members, Ogmot, of course, dropped his dream journal. And it's a sort of thing. You may have passed over this item as trash when you were playing the game. Maybe you missed out the videos that people made, that we made. But there's interesting stuff there because one passage talks about two fleets clashing on a sea of blood and shadow rising below them. I think it's extremely obvious what that is. That's obviously referring to the whole Najatar thing, Ashari using the Tidestone. And that just makes sense because Najatar was the moment that the faction expansion very much made its moves towards, well, becoming an old god expansion. And it was the Dream Journal that was our first super rock solid evidence of that happening. Now, of course, the Naga elements of Battle for Azeroth were set up in Legion, with Ashara's return in the Azuna zone, but also some great Naga lore. You've got Sharas Dal, the Resto Shaman artifact weapon, which was uh, actually the first full telling of the Highborn's transformation into the Naga, and its description was mirrored in Warbringer's Ashara. So that was an artifact weapon, but it was also them setting up a patch of BFA. And then speaking of this big faction war, some of its greatest atrocities, this is going to blow your mind, were foreshadowed all the way back in 2012 because in Tides of War, the novel, the day after the destruction of Theramore, Jaina demanded the Kirin Tor retaliate against Orgrimmar, saying this, What will it take for you to realize that the Horde will eventually turn in you? Will you act when Teldrassil falls? when they are burning a world tree. Well, Jaina didn't have to wait until BFA for the Kirin Tor to turn, but the world tree did. Then there were hints to the expansions of uh, you know, new zones. In Oceanus Cove, there actually were shipwrecked Kul Tiran marines and Zandalari captives. Next expansion's BFA, come on. And then, this is the big one. In the Fellhammer, the DH Order Hall, the globe actually shows Kalteras and Zandalar. But it's really hard to see because of the angle. And this was actually referenced by a developer as a missed hint. And I'm not surprised. Those hints were sitting there in Legion, and we just completely missed them. In the bloody Demon Hunter Order Hall, it was sitting there all along. Kind of crazy. The third Legion invasion, then, was actually hinted all the way back in Vanilla. In Nagaz's letter, we actually discovered that the Syndicate were working with a splinter faction of the Shadow Council, who were named the Argus Wake. And they were actually preparing the way for the Third Host, which, yes, is the Third Legion invasion. Of course, fast forward to Missa Pandaria, and you've got that uh, similar scene with Rathian, where, you know, he ate Leishan's heart, and he basically warned us about the Legion. Pretty damn clear. And then next, Illidan's Redemption. That's a big part of Legion, and it was actually talked about a few times by Chris Metzen, like even way before Legion. Basically, he believed, as we all did, that Illidan had a rough arc in the Burning Crusade, and he was looking for a cool way to reintroduce one of his favorite characters. And you can actually see that process begin in Cataclysm's revamp of Felwood, because there we meet a demon hunter who told us of the many different ways that Azeroth would have actually suffered had Illidan not been there. So this in Cata was Blizzard shining a sympathetic light on a villain that the Burning Crusade had basically wrote off as mad. Then for Legion, we've got the Black Harvest. They were actually foreshadowed in Miss of Pandaria in the Warlock Greenfire questline. One of the chain's rewards was the book Legacy of the Masters, 
describing six powerful warlocks forming the Black Harvest. Their mission of controlling Fel, without its usual, uh, you know, corrupting madness stuff, uh, presumably those same masters went on to form the nucleus of the Warlock Order Hall. So again, pretty neat. Now there weren't many hints pointing to Legion having a whole bunch of old god content, but the Emerald Nightmare had a long-standing uh, connection to both Void and Disorder. And that meant it was extremely tantalizing for us lore nuts whenever Archimonde dropped a fragment from the Emerald Nightmare, even though we defeated him in the Twisting Nether in AU Draenor. That, of course, led us directly into the Emerald Nightmare raid. Wad time. Well, as much as Garrosh or Gul'dan were the villains of Wad, it was actually Rathian who split the timelines because he worked with Kairos. You might have missed the whole thing of Kairos being a villain eventually, but Kairos uh, was actually teased as a villain when he was our mate in the Timeless Isles. We retrieved the Vision of Time Hourglass, and one of the potential visions of the future had Kairos standing over the dead body of Sora Dormi, Nors Dumu's consort. But that wasn't the only significant vision that we would see. There was a vision with two potential futures. One showed victory at the Siege of Orkhamar, and the other one showed, uh, well, not victory. It showed Garrosh destroying Stormwind Harbor. Now, when the Siege of Orkhamar actually happened, Raffian was ultimately furious at Varian for letting the Horde choose a new war chief, right? He wanted Varian to just wipe them all out. Raffian, of course, wanted Azeroth to be controlled by a single super faction in order to prepare it for the imminent threat of the Legion of course, we had learned about after the events of the Throne of Thunder. Rathian basically swore he'd do anything to protect Azeroth, and for him that did include breaking the timelines with Kairos so that Garrosh could begin the Iron Horde. Now, there was a big hint then in the Siege of Orgrimmar itself, because Siege Crafter Blackfuse is actually the guy who designed all the Iron Horde technology. He blasts us with Iron Stars, and as he dies, he shouts, my legacy will live on. Now remember, Siege of Orgrimmar came out before Warlords of Draenor was unveiled. So when we first saw those lines from Siegecrafter Blackfuse, well, we had no idea just how correct he would be. There is a lingering question from all of this, though, and it is Sora Dormi. I mean, we saw a vision of her death, yet she has not died. And we're pretty sure it's her death that kind of leads to Nors Dumu, you know, going a bit crazy. So, because it's all timey-wimey bullshit, I have to wonder if that will come to pass soon. And even if it could come to pass in a way where Kairos could actually still do it. It's Pandaria time. So, the Pandaren were really Azeroth's worst kept secret. They began as a Christmas picture that Samwise Didier uh, painted of himself and his daughter. And then they became an in-joke in Reign of Chaos, with an April Fool's Day joke about them actually becoming the fifth playable race in Warcraft 3. Only for the Frozen Throne to actually add the Brewmaster Hero unit, making them pretty damn real. And of course, all the stuff with Chen and the founding of Orgrimmar. Now before Mists, you could actually find hints of the Pandaren around Azeroth. On the shores of Darkshore, there's actually a skeleton of a distinctly Pandaren-looking turtle. Now, a quest in the area says that it's a Naga Chariot, but have you ever actually seen a Naga Turtle Chariot in-game? I haven't. And the Barons even has a quest to brew Chen Stormstout's famous brew. Then during Kata, there was actually some debate amongst players over the shape on globes. So this could have been the North Pole. It also kind of looked like a turtle. Some people say it was a graphical issue with basically folding assets over a sphere, but others thought it was in fact our very first hints at the Wandering Isle. And just to break into a little bit of meta discussion here for this section, the teases in Missa Pandaria are super interesting, and it's because, from what I understand, Legion was actually in a stage of pre-production at Blizzard, at around the time of Mop. And that meant the team basically were able to do either WAD or Legion in whatever order they pleased. I'm fairly sure that the movie tie-in part of WAD sealed the deal, but that's why in Missa Pandaria, you do see all of that teasing going on, especially the Legion stuff. Even though, of course, Anima was also teased in it, and that's a Shadowlands thing. 
So, there you have it. That is what we could dig up, but... Did you miss anything? Who knows, there could be a few buried gems that we actually don't even know about, so hit me up if you do know anything else. Uh, then just patrons, thank you uh, over there. I mean, hey, the patrons got this video a few days early, all the podcast content, loot, other things, and this era where we're trying to, well, make it so we can actually make the content we truly want to make, your support's been incredible. So thank you, I hope you enjoyed today, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.